the 32nd edition of the Carlisle Middle School 8th grade form. Form is an annual tradition that has become a rite of passage for the 8th grade students. It was originally developed in 1990 by Mrs. Linda Gibson in conjunction with the late Peggy Ford. Forum is a formal research paper on an important current or historical topic. The History and English departments coordinate the Forum program to enable students to develop critical reading and writing skills using historical analysis, primary and secondary resources, and contemporary media. Students learn the value of academic research and of exploring various points of view. They investigate assigned topics and create a multi-draft research paper which is ultimately crafted into a short oral presentation. Let's take this opportunity to recognize all of our eighth grade students for all of their hard work. I know we will all want to thank the eighth grade parents for their advice and support during this complex project. Also join me in recognizing Ms. Linda Gibson and Mrs. Meredith Nicoletti for their countless hours of advising, coaching, reading rough drafts, making corrections and suggestions, and instilling in their students the importance of always doing their best work. Thank you so much for your efforts. They are greatly appreciated. Now let's welcome this morning's panelists. Mrs. Gracie Agnew has served in ed education for 47 years. After graduating from high school, she attended Winston-Salem State University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in English. She began her teaching career in 1974 for the Henry County School System. Virginia Tech awarded her a Master's of Arts in Education in 1985. And from the University of Virginia, she earned an endorsement in supervision and administration. In addition to being an English teacher, she has served as adjunct faculty for Patrick Henry Community College, an administrative intern, assistant principal, principal, director of secondary instruction, and an educational consultant, as well as a university supervisor for Longwood University. Currently, her role is Carlisle's head of school. With the exception of three years in North Carolina, all of her professional experience has been in Virginia. Supervisor for Longwood University. Currently her role, with the exception of three, she has been on numerous boards, including the Harvest Foundation, NCI, Piedmont Community Service, CHIL, Boys and Girls Club, and the Regional Library. Currently she serves as member of the EDC board. One of her greatest honors was being named the Virginia State Principal of the Year. Welcome, Mrs. Agnew. making his first appearance as a panelist for forum is Mr. Brian Pace. Prior to joining New College Institute in 2018, Brian Pace served 25 years in public education. He spent nine years with Henry County Schools as a math teacher and an administrator. During his last 16 years in education, Brian was the director of the Piedmont Governor's School for, for Mathematics, Science, and Technology. He was a member of the academic year Governor Schools Directors Consortium, where he served as the chairman for two years. Brian also served two terms on the Virginia Advisory Committee for the Education of the Gifted, serving as chairman of the committee during part of his term. Brian obtained undergraduate degrees from Virginia Tech and Averett University and earned his master's degree from Radford University. In January of 2019, Brian was named the Coordinator of Advanced Manufacturing at the New College Institute. Brian also served as the lead mentor for the New College Institute's first robotics team, 1262. Brian is married to Melissa Pace, and they have two sons, Jason and Adam, and they are the proud grandparents of Riley, Cooper, and Carson. Welcome, Mr. Pace. Our senior representative is Zach Suther. Zach lives in Ridgeway, Virginia, and the son of Penny Suther. He is the class president for this year's senior class. Zach has attended Carlisle since sixth grade. He is a writer for the Carlisle Literary Magazine. 
Zach is in the 78th Virginia Boys State Designee and Mayor of Patton City. He also is an honorable delegate representing the Bahamas at the Model UN and the Walentis Scholarship nominee. Zach enjoys playing guitar, tennis, listening to and writing music, drawing art, and writing stories. He has performed in several Carlisle Players musicals, including playing Santa in The Elf, and he will be Danny Zuko in the upcoming production of Grease. He is the guitarist for the Mercy Crossings Choir and Band, as well as a volunteer at the Ridgeway District Volunteer Rescue Squad. Zach wants to pursue an EMT certification and eventually a paramedic license at Patrick and Henry Community College and then transfer to a four-year university. Zach fondly remembers working with Mrs. Gibson and Mrs. Warner on his own forum project on the topic of big data learns too much about us. Are we trading in our privacy for convenience and what are the implications of the dangers of these interactions? Welcome, Zach. Now join me in welcoming our two um, eighth grade speakers today. Peyton Brightwell is the daughter of Stephen Brightwell and our own athletic director, Melinda Brightwell. Her sister Finley was doing a forum presentation just three years ago, and her little brother Easton can look forward to his forum in six years. They all live in Ridgeway. Peyton is multifaceted playing soccer, travel soccer, Carlisle soccer, and tennis baking and lots of reading. She is a member of the Junior Honor Society and hopes to become a physical therapist. Peyton's forum topic is the life and times of John D. Rockefeller, old man extraordinaire, the Sunday school teacher people love to hate. Brady Wells lives in Martinsville. He is the son of Julie Wells and PC Wells. Brady enjoys scouting. He plays soccer and golf here at Carlisle. On the snowy mountainsides, he goes snowboarding and also rides his mountain bike. He also is interested in cars. An interest in cars helped with his forum subject, automobile and assembly line pioneer, Henry Ford. Please join me in welcoming Peyton to the podium. When John D. Rockefeller was only 16 years old, he said, Someday I wish to be worth $100,000. $100,000 in 1857 would be worth more than $3 million today. No one suspected that the quiet boy with patched overalls would surpass both these values and become president of a multi billion dollar company that would control over 90% of the world's oil refining and dominate the petroleum industry worldwide. He would become the richest man in the modern world and the prototype philanthropist, donating, donating over $500 million in his lifetime. John Davison Rockefeller was born on July 8, 1839 in Richmond, New York, to William and Eliza Rockefeller. Rockefeller's early life was not luxurious. His father was often gone on business trips, and his mother was busy, busy parenting Rockefeller's five siblings. He was an average student throughout high school and later attended a 10-week course at Folsom Commercial College. In 1859, Rockefeller, along with Maurice Clark, started his first business as a commissions merchant. They would make a small fortune when the Civil War broke out, allowing Rockefeller to build his reputation and gain business knowledge. During this time in Pennsylvania, Edwin Drake was making the discovery that would change the oil industry. Drake, an employee of Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company, was sent to Pennsylvania to formulate a method to procure oil in large amounts. In 1859, he struck oil with his drill, causing a boom in the oil industry, which would cause others to try their luck. In 1862, Clark and Rockefeller formed an oil company. By 1865, Rockefeller had purchased complete business control. A year later, his brother William Rockefeller joined the business. Together, they built a refinery in Cleveland and named it Standard Works. This would mark the beginning of Rockefeller's oil company. In another life-changing move during the same decade, Rockefeller reconnected with childhood classmate Laura Celestia Spillman, who had become a teacher in Cleveland. Rockefeller married Laura in 1864, and the family grew with the birth of five children. 
one boy, four girls. In 1867, Rockefeller created a partnership with Henry Flagler that would last for years. They had previously met when Rockefeller was in the commission business. Together, their business quickly grew and began to dominate the oil industry. Before 1870, only the rich could afford to light their house for long and regard, because whale blubber was used as a life source. Whales had long been hunted for their blubber to the point of near extinction. The price of whale oil surged and prices became too expensive for the average family. Rockefeller and Flagler decided to start refining and selling kerosene as an alternate light source. Kerosene lasted longer, made better light, and was cheaper than whale oil. Kerosene prices drastically dropped from 58 to 8 cents per gallon. Prices became so affordable that electrical lights were momentarily stalled until the mid-1880s. On January 10, 1870, John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, Henry Flagler, Samuel Andrew, and other associates created the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. At the time of the company's formation, it controlled approximately 10% of the oil industry. During these times, the oil industry was profitable but unreliable. The growth of the oil industry flooded the market with crude oil and high levels of waste. Rockefeller believed he held the solution to this problem. He knew one cohesive oil market with one large integrated firm would work better than numerous ineffective Rockefeller began his plan to consolidate the oil industry. Smaller refineries were to be appraised, and owners were to be offered standard oil stock in proportion to the estimated value of their property. More knowledgeable <coughs> owners were brought into standard oil management. Many owners would later protest their treatment by standard oil with claims of intimidation. Yet evidence shows many of standard oil's rivals were paid a fair and generous amount for the property. By 1879, Standard Oil controlled an estimated 90% of refining in the U.S. Standard Oil had monopolized the oil industry, was exporting 70% of its product. The company had become so powerful that Rockefeller, now 40 years old, only dealt with major company issues. The Standard Oil Trust was formed in 1882. A board of nine trustees was put in place, and all standard properties were placed in their control. The trust controlled all aspects of Standard Oil. Standard Oil's success continued with the advancement of the automobile. The automobile brought a need for a power source to fuel the engines. Previously, gasoline was considered useless and often dumped in rivers. Rockefeller began to refine gasoline and sell it as fuel for newly emerging automobiles. By 1911, gasoline sales were top kerosene as Standard Oil's number one product. As companies formed a large trust to control railroads, shipping, and oil industries, reform-minded journalists known as muckrakers reported on how these big businesses affected the public. Ida Tarbell, an active journalist who would later be known as the woman who took on a tycoon, was one of these muckrakers. When Tarbell was young, her father fell victim to the Cleveland Massacre, when John Rockefeller had purchased smaller oil refineries in Ohio and western Pennsylvania, and her father refused to sell. He was forced to sell his home in order to pay off debts. In 1900, while Tarbell was working for McClure's magazine, she wrote a 19-part series and later a book on the inner workings of the Standard Oil Company and Trust. In the series, Tarbell criticized what she felt were Rockefeller's unethical business practices. After the series publication, the public began to harbor a dislike towards the company. Soon, the Standard Trust would be forced to break up. In 1909, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the Standard Oil Trust. The lawsuit claimed Standard Oil was restricting trade through preferential deals with the railroads. The government found the trust in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The act established in 1890 was the first federal act to outlaw monopolistic businesses. The act gave the federal government the right to force any trust restricting trade to disband. In 1911, after Rockefeller had already retired, the Supreme Court ruled against the Standard Oil Company, stating the company was in unreasonable restraint of interstate commerce. Standard Oil would be organized in the 34 smaller Standard Oil with firms. The larger of these firms would later be known as ExxonMobil and Chevron. Regardless of the government's attempt to weaken Standard Oil, the smaller firms originating from the trust generated more income from the parent company. John D. Rockefeller retired around 1895, but never made a public announcement. John Archibald, a long-serving vice president, took over Standard Oil. For the remainder of his years, Rockefeller's activities were charitable. 
founded numerous charitable organizations, including the General Education Board, the University of Chicago, and the Rockefeller University. He made significant donations to numerous colleges and universities, such as Spelman College, named for his wife. He established the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission, which was responsible for eradicating hookworm in the South. At his peak in 1912, Rockefeller was worth an estimated $23.6 billion in modern day currency. Mm. Rockefeller made oil and petroleum products affordable and accessible to everyone. He created the modern oil industry, which powers the world economy today. It is estimated that during his lifetime, he gave away more than $540 million. Since his death, Rockefeller Foundations have given more than $17 billion to charities and nonprofits all over the world. Leaving an impressive legacy for a man who simply dreamed of making a hundred thousand dollars. Before Henry Ford started mass producing automobiles, they were a luxury toy for the very wealthy, much as personal jets are today. Autos were handmade by skilled craftsmen and driven by chauffeur or mechanics because they broke down often. The Model T and Henry Ford's assembly line were pivotal innovations in American history. Ford's production advancements resulted in lower costing cars and higher paying jobs. Model T automobiles also transformed transportation and highways. They made it possible for individuals to live farther away from work, see distant relatives, and take vacations. In 1903, there were around 150 miles of paved road in America. By 1930, there were more than 500,000 miles of paved road connecting rural and suburban areas to urban centers. The, bu the buggy whip manufacturers and carriage makers were about to find themselves out of business, but dozens of other industries were getting jump started when Henry Ford started turning out Model T's on the first modern assembly line. Henry Ford significantly changed American life when he mass produced automobiles that middle class and working class people could afford. Henry Ford was born, on Dearborn, born in Dearborn, Michigan on July 30th, 1963. He was the oldest of six children. Ford's interest in mechanics started when he was gifted a watch for his 11th birthday. Ford would take the, watch, take the watch apart and learn how it worked. At 12, Ford spent most of his time tinkering with anything he could get his hands on in a local machine shop. Three years later, at 15, Ford constructed his first steam engine. Ford was 16 when his parents let him move to Detroit, where he became a machinist apprentice. Here, Ford made boats and improved his steam engine. He then spent two years installing and fixing steam engines in Michigan. Ford came back to his hometown and he met and married Claire Jane Bryant, an active woman suffragist. Ford went to work for the Edison Company in Detroit and had a son named Edsel. Ford also met Thomas Edison when he became chief engineer. His relationship with Edison would be important throughout his life. While he was with the Edison Company, he worked on an internal, internal combustion engine on his kitchen table. He developed a lightweight quadricycle for one person, and he was finally able to start his first company making autos, the Detroit Automobile Company, at the turn of the century. Ford produced an early race car, which did not win races, but made his auto company get noticed. A new company needs notice to get backers. When he had a dispute with his backers, he sold his company to Cadillac in 1902. A year later, Ford, Ford and his family, and several other, several other investors, started Ford Motor Company. He built a luxury car and race cars, but finally, in 1908, he produced the car that would make him famous and started automobile production in this country that would define manufacturing success for all time. The Model T, mass-produced, affordable, sturdy, and efficient was the car that would change life and usher in the modern world. He achieved his goal of creating a universal automobile. Because Henry Ford passed on production savings to his customers, Ford Motor Company could offer the automobile from anywhere between $260 and $850. Mm -hmm. 
Henry Ford was the first to test the Model T, taking on a hunting expedition to Wisconsin in northern Michigan. The Model T was famed for its stunts, which included timing, climbing the Tennessee State Capitol stairs and reaching the summit of Pikes Peak. By 1913, the demand for Model Ts were high. At a time, only few automobiles were assembled per day. They were made by hand by eight, by eight or two, or by two or eight workers. In April 1913, Ford made the first move towards an assembly line. It was used a conveyor belt to move components past workers performing one or two activities at a time. The assembly line changed how things were made forever, but it was not an instant hit amongst the workers. The work was grueling and tiring. Ford hired twice the number of workers, knowing some would quit. By 1914, Ford set a precedent for the industry, raising the daily salary for an eight-hour day up to five dollars, previously only being two dollars and thirty-four cents for nine hours. These new rates meant plenty of new workers. Ford's new mass manufacturing tactics allowed the company to produce one Model T every 24 seconds. The prices of the Model T dropped even lower. By 1918, half of all automobiles in America were Model Ts. By 1925, Ford Motor Company was the largest automobile manufacturer in the world, having produced 15 million Model Ts. Ford also established plants and operations all over the world. In 1927, Ford began to manufacture most, for the parts of, most of the parts for his vehicles as well. The huge industrial complex was placed in his hometown, Dearborn, Michigan. The plant includes a glass factory, steel mill, and all other automotive-related components. Because Ford was having, starting to have competition from companies that made cars in its colors besides black, the Model T was also phased out of production, making room for the Model A. The improvements included improved horsepower, stronger bake, brakes, and other features. Although the Model A was a great car, it was made just two years before the Great Depression. During the Depression, most would have trouble affording something like a car. With disappointing sales, the Model A was phased out of production in 1931. Ford needed to design something to revive the company. Ford introduced the first V8 engine in 1932. The eight cylinders to help the car be one of the fastest of its time with a top speed of 79 miles per hour and weighing around 2,400 pounds. The public loved it. The V8 severely helped the company's sales after the Depression. Ford's son Edsel died in 1943, so Henry Ford resumed the presidency until he could hand, it over to the, hand over the control to his grandson, Henry Ford II. In later years, Ford received numerous awards and recognitions. He was the Time Magazine Man of the Year. The government put him on a postage stamp, and Fortune Magazine named him Businessman of the Century in 1999. During his lifetime, Ford gave away about a third of his wealth to charities of many kinds. The Ford Foundation received most of his wealth when he died. The foundation has billions of dollars and gave away just $500 million last year, supporting various medical and children's charities. Following a stroke, Henry Ford died at his home on April 7, 1947, at 83. The next day, most auto manufacturers would shut down in respect of Mr. Ford. Even though he died 75 years ago, his legacy still carries on. Before the automobile, people never tra traveled far from home. Most people live their whole life within a few miles of where they were born. But now, 100, 100 years later, after the in invention of inexpensive, mass-produced automobiles, the average American travels more than 14,000 miles per year. Economically, the automobile's impact is equally impressive. Amongst the industries dependent on automobile manufacturing, the glass industry employs 95,000. The tire industry employs 740,000 and the petroleum industry supports 9.8 million American jobs, or 5.6% of total U.S. employment. In addition, all companies incorporate the assembly line into their manufacturing process. Henry Ford's ideas are still used and are still important worldwide.
We'll now take questions from our panelists. Excellent job. I really enjoyed hearing about John D. Rockefeller and Henry Ford. Our first question is for you, Peyton. Um, I'm going to give you a statement, and this statement actually came from uh, John D. He said, it was a good thing to let the money be my servant and not to make myself a slave to money. Using your research, do you think that that statement that he made was actually true? He was not a servant to money. I do think he was definitely not a servant to money. I think the money definitely helped serve him in numerous ways as his life went on. And I think he benefited a lot from the money, but I don't think he was a servant to the money. Thank you very much. And now, Brady, for you. You know, today we have career and technical education we have both tech centers set up all around the United States. You gave us some information about the early life of Henry Ford. Do you think that if he were here today, that he would be a good candidate for career and technical education? And if so, why? Um, I think he could do that because from early, from early life, he was very well driven and he, I think he put a lot of passion into it. And he tried very hard. I think he could, yes. Thank you very much. I also want to say both of you did a great job. I'm, I'm amazed at how comfortable you were and, and the knowledge that you had there. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Peyton, my question to you is, <clears throat> obviously Rockefeller's money, that, that attracts us all. But if you had to do your research, what do you think is probably the most important characteristic that he had that made him successful. How driven he was. He was driven to make something of himself. From early life, he always knew that he, he was going to do something with his life. That was set in his mind, but he knew he was going to make something out of himself. Thank you, Dave. Brady, you spent some time on this. I just want you to elaborate on a little bit more. Because you mentioned the assembly line and importance, and we now take that for advantage. We, we've seen assembly lines. And why was it so important back when uh, Henry Ford started the assembly line? What, what was the importance of that? Um, it really split the production time and even more than half. It's used everywhere now. It's very important for how everything's made now. Yeah, it's amazing. This many years later, it's still such a huge, important part of manufacturing. So, all right, thank you guys. Good job to both of you. They're very nice speeches. Uh, Peyton, my first question is for you. Um, many people say the money is the root of all evil, and that it can be kind of corrupting. Um, so how do you think money changed Rockefeller, and if there wasn't intervention from the government, how things would have been different? I don't necessarily, I think Rockefeller, he stayed pretty much the same way. From a young age, he was always very religious, and his mother always taught him he should donate to charity. And he continued that from the time he was 16 to all the way to he died, he was always donating money. And I think had the government not intervened, he would have had even more opportune money to donate, because he spent his whole life donating to charities. Thank you. And for Brady, uh, of course, many things have changed since the time of loyalty. Um, how do you think the market for vehicles have changed and what, how companies are you know, changing their production habits or, or changing their market from the Model T or when, when vehicles first came around, I guess? Um, back then, the car needed to be able to do everything. Now there's more things for certain types of what, what you want. More, more, more directors want things. Get a fast car or things to drive a family or something like that. Thank you. Let's have another round. Well, our 
next two speakers please join me on stage. Jayla Niblett is the daughter of Angela Niblett and our own coach, Jason Niblett. She lives in Collinsville. She started kindergarten at Carlisle, left for a while, and returned to us this year. She has a wide range of interests. Jayla plays AAU basketball and Carlisle's varsity basketball. She is also a pianist who enjoys spending time with her family and friends. Jayla would like to earn a Division I scholarship and sees herself as an attorney, a physician, or an own entrepreneur. Jayla will give us the inspiring story of the Women's Basketball Association. DeAmber Harris is the daughter of the late Shavika Harris and the granddaughter of our own Miss Diane Watkins of Martinsville. DeAmber entered our life in the fifth grade. Her sister Daisy and brother Damien are both Carlisle graduates. DeAmber is a praise dancer in her church and a valued member of the Carlisle basketball team and volleyball team. She plays the guitar and aspires to go into a medical field eventually as a nurse or perhaps a doctor. DeAmber investigated the life and achievements of super athlete and successful businessman, Michael Jordan. Please join me in welcoming Jayla to the stage. Penny Toller dreamed of playing professional basketball in the United States, but that's all it ever was, just a dream. She went overseas to play in Italy because she never thought she would be able to play professionally in the U.S. The Women's National Basketball Association, also known as the WBA, was finally formed in 1997. It was a new day for women's sports, which allowed women to be empowered by playing the sport that they loved. Dreams were formed and became a reality for players in the United States. Before the WNBA was born, playing in the U.S. was not an option. The only chance women would have playing professionally would be overseas in places such as Italy, France, Germany, and Sweden. This association was for women who desired to compete on a national level. It was created by the National Basketball Association. They already had a men's league, known as the NBA, but not one for women. Many complained about this issue, demanding equal rights for women as well. The WNBA has grown tremendously over the years. It took years to get it up and going because they had to find the right players, pick the teams, names, and colors. This association started out with eight teams and now has expanded it to 12. The number of fans have also increased about 80%. To be eligible to play in the WBA, players have to be at least 22 years of age. They do this to make sure the players have an opportunity to get a college education or at least four years out of high school. Although the WBA and NBA have things in common, there are many differences between the two. For example, pay scale and attendance. The average, the average salary for an NBA player is about $8 million, while for the WNBA, it's only about $75,000 annually. So therefore, the WNBA the WNBA only makes about 1% of what NBA players make. Now for the television side of things. The men's league gets about 3 million views per game, while the WNBA gets around 230,000 views. The men's league also leads the women in attendance by about 20,000 seats. I've attended NBA games and I've also attended WNBA games. There is definitely a difference. The crowd is more involved at an NBA game rather than a WNBA game. Many great athletes have played this game. Some of the best are Diana Taurasi, Cynthia Cooper, Lisa Leslie, and Candace Parker. Now, 
One of the all-time best is Candace Parker. Parker grew up with her parents and two older brothers, Marcus and Anthony Parker. Anthony Parker was an NBA player, and Parker was just 15 when she had her first dunk. After graduating high school, she attended college, and later on went to play for the Los Angeles Sparks. Parker is currently playing for the Chicago Sky. She's had such a great impact on this game. She's able to play any position on the floor, from the point guard to the post. She's won MVPs and also a championship. She's been named Defensive Player of the Year and, been, and has been a Red Mountain champion. Her average salary is one of the highest in the league, which is about $190,000 annually. Now, to compete on this competitive level, players have to train extremely hard, at least five times a week. Players have to eat healthy, have dedication, love, and passion. This will include running, lifting, dribbling, and shooting. These players had to work hard to get where they are today. Some had a hard life growing up, but because they worked so hard to get where they wanted to be, they will never have to worry about struggling financially again. There have been many great coaches to come to this league. Some of the best are Van Chancellor, Michael Cooper, and Mike Tebow. The coach that I personally think has the best record would have to be Michael Cooper. He coached for the Los Angeles Sparks in Atlanta. In his two seasons, he won 56 games and only lost eight between the two seasons. That is very impressive and hard to do. He's won championships and appeared in the WNBA Finals back to back. His coaching record stands at 230 and 150 which is a very impressive number in the coaching world. NBA coaches make about $3 million more than what a WNBA coach makes. The WNBA has changed the women's basketball circuit forever. It has had such a tremendous impact on this game. It definitely took a while starting up, but it was worth it. This will continue to get better and expand. The players, and the coaches have made this league what it is today. This association is an important part of women's basketball. It offers an incentive to young athletes and helps players reach their full potential while being able to make money and be in the face of women's basketball, all while doing something the players truly love. For a player who has missed more than 9,000 shots in his career, that is nothing compared to his 32,292 points he has made. Michael Jordan is one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He won the Most Valuable Player Award five times, and he was the College Player of the Year in 1984. Michael Jordan led the Chicago Bulls to six National Basketball Association, or NBA championships. He has had much success on and off the court. Jordan played baseball for a year, and he has a very successful business life. He owns the Charlotte Hornets basketball team and has a business relationship with the Nike Shoe Company. He is now a billionaire and has a net worth of $1.6 billion. Michael Jeffrey Jordan was born on February 17, 1963, in Brooklyn, New York. He was the third son of James and Dolores Jordan. Michael has four siblings, two older brothers, a younger sister, and an older sister. When he was five, his family moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. He went to Trask Middle School, where he received multiple certificates and achievements in football and basketball. He was not very focused in school. This changed when he started going to Laney High School. He was a B student and was an amazing athlete. At Laney, he was the first person in high school history to get a triple-double in which a player makes 10 points, 10 assists, and 10 rebounds. The next two seasons on varsity, he averaged 25 points each game. In 1982, he led his team to win the North Carolina NCAA title. Years after he graduated from Laney High, he donated $1.1 million to his high school. 
Michael Jordan was a very talented player, so he was accepted into the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1981. UNC is one of the most competitive basketball programs in the country. When Jordan enrolled at Carolina, he was terrified to play for Dean Smith. He told Slam Magazine that he was pretty nervous when he met Dean Smith. However, the coach was really nice and caring. Coach Smith was a legendary coach, and he had taken many teams to the finals of NCAA. He only recruited the best players in the country. Jordan, had coached, Jordan and Coach Smith became lifelong friends. Jordan left college after his junior year to go to the NBA. In 1984, Jordan was drafted by the Chicago Bulls and was the third overall pick. He played his entire professional career with the Bulls, wearing his number 23 jersey. During his first season as a professional, he led his team in scoring and was named the Rookie of the Year. He was also selected for the All-Star Game. Unfortunately, during his second season of playing, Jordan faced an injury. During the third game of the season in 1985, he broke his left foot against the Golden State Warriors but he still was able to come back by the end of the season. One thing that Jordan did was stick his tongue out. He always took out his tongue when he was driving to the basket because that was what his father did while he was working. Jordan played on the American team for the Barcelona Olympics in 1984. He also participated in the 1992 Olympics held in Los Angeles. Jordan helped his team bring home the gold medals both times. His team was called the Dream Team. They named themselves the Dream Team because of Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Charles Barkley, three of the best basketball players ever. In all the 13 years that Michael Jordan played with the Bulls, they always had a talented team. They made it to the Eastern Conference Finals in the 1990s. They won their first NBA championship the following year by defeating the Los Angeles Lakers. Michael Jordan has always had a huge impact on his team. He wanted everyone on his team to work just as hard as he did. Martinsville High School men's coach, men's basketball coach Jeff Atkins, who, who played with Michael Jordan in UNC and Maryland games, remembered he was the most competitive person I ever knew. He was the first person in the gym and the last person to leave, and he expected everyone else to have that same work ethic. Jordan briefly retired from basketball in 1994 to play baseball. Many people felt that the reason for this unexpected move was Michael Jordan's dad's death. James Jordan was killed on July 23, 1993, while he was asleep in his car. Michael Jordan was devastated at his father's death, so he decided to join minor league baseball. He played as an outfielder. According to Jordan, he decided to play after his father, who really wanted him to play baseball, had died. He pitched 45 consecutive scoreless innings. Jordan only had a .202 batting average, but people who played with him said he was an extremely dedicated player with lots of potential. His coach said, I do think with another 1,000 at-bats, he would have made it. Baseball wasn't the only thing that he picked up. I truly believe, I truly believe that he rediscovered himself, his joy for competition. Michael Jordan eventually went back to the sport he loved in 1995 to 1996 at the age of 33. He had an amazing season. He led the Bulls to an all-time scoring, an all-time record of wins. He also led them in scoring an eighth-time record. He was named league MVP at the age of 34. Jordan led his team in scoring for the ninth time, which meant he beat Carl Malone in the finals. At the age of 35, Jordan was a 10-time scoring champion. He was a five-time MVP and a six-time finals MVP. He's the oldest player to do that. From 2001 to 2003, Jordan played for the Washington Wizards at the age of 40. Jordan was the oldest player to score 40 points a game. He was averaging 20 points per game. He played in all 82 of the Wizards games from the ages of 32 to 40. Jordan played in 473 games. Michael Jordan had an amazing basketball career and has the awards to prove it. Jordan has NBA titles and also three finals MVP titles, two regular season MVP titles, and three scoring titles. Jordan received the MVP award from the NBA in 1988. He received this award four more times in 1991, 92, 96, and 98. In April 2009, he received the greatest basketball honors. He was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. 
Michael Jordan was even presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom for President Obama in 2016. Jordan also had an outstanding outside of basketball life too. Jordan is involved in many profitable businesses. Michael Jordan is part owner of the Charlotte Hornets basketball team. He signed his first deal with Nike. He serves on the Nike Board of Directors. Nike launched Air Jordans on April 1st, 1985. They also gave Jordan 25% in royalty. Michael, Michael Jordan's shoes became very popular and continue to be best sellers. Over the years, Jordan signed a number of endorsement deals for brands like Hanes, Upper Deck, Gatorade, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's, and many more. Jordan earns $2 billion in revenue every year from his brand Jordans. Michael Jordan has become wealthy primarily through his partnership with Nike. The year after that, his value shot up tremendously to $500 million. Another thing he is really good at is being a businessman. In the world of business, Jordan earns $1.2 billion. He also owns seven restaurants and even a car dealership. Michael Jordan also had a contract with Haynes. With this endorsement, he made just under $200 million annually. He was also the lead actor in the movie Space Jam where Michael Jordan helped Looney Tunes regain their freedom. The film has a big place in NBA fans' hearts. Michael Jordan gives often to charities. In 2002, he donated his entire salary to the 9-11 charities. He also donated to charities that were helping people who were hit, by, hit hard by Hurricane Duran. Michael Jordan has been married twice. Together, he has five kids. The first time he was married was in 1989. They were married for 17 years. He is currently married to Yvette Perita. Though Michael Jordan is retired from basketball, many of, many, millions of people still want to be reminded of his games and his greatness. The 10 part Netflix series called The Last Dance tells the story of his life and time with the Chicago Bulls. Jordan was a transformative figure in professional basketball. He was one of the kind. Really enjoyed those as well. You all did a magnificent job. Um, the first question is for you, Jayla. You have hope that things are going to change in terms of the Women's National Basketball Association. Why do you think things will change? It took a long time to even establish, and and now um, you know you mentioned that. We listened to you tell us about the salaries not being even close to comparable. So what makes you think that things will change? This association has grown tremendously over the years. Um, it started out very low in fans, um, very low in income, and over the years it has grown. So I believe as the years grow, go on and better players come into this league, it will continue to get better and there will be more fans. It's growing. Um, I think it will continue to grow. The next question deals with uh, Michael Jordan down in Charlotte. He has done some, some pretty amazing things. You mentioned several um, charities that, that he has made these huge contributions. Uh, he also made the contribution you mentioned to his his high school. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those health clinics that, that he built and why he built those health clinics? Did you read anything about those down in Charlotte? No, that did not emerge. But out of my own opinion, I feel like Jordan really wants to help people and that's the reason why he gave so much to charities. And I believe he built those for like more people to have better health and can go to places for help. You're 100% right. He did do it because there were um, people in need in those communities and he made sure that they could have the health care. So you're right on point. Thank you. Jamie, I'll start with you. Good job. Um, you educated me. That's a lot I didn't know until after your speech. And uh, one of the things that really caught my attention is if they can't join the WNBA until they're 22 years of age, 
I thought was extremely interesting because that's not the rule when it comes to the, the men's sport. What's your feelings on that rule? I don't think that is necessarily fair for women. I think women should have the same opportunities as men do. And men, they can join anytime at 19, at the young age, not at 19. And women have to wait. Um, I don't think that is fair. I think that they should change it because anything that a man can do, I believe a woman can do. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, Amber, I'm just, I'm, I've got to ask you this. You know, there's a lot of debate over who is the greatest basketball player ever. I think I know who you may say, but, and, and some of those players are even still playing at this point. But uh, based on what you, in your research and your love of basketball, who do you think the number one basketball player is? Well, I have a lot of basketball players that I really like. Right. But I would say it would be Michael Jordan, just because he's done a lot of great things besides just play basketball. And not a lot of basketball players have done that. But he was also a, an extremely awesome basketball player and paved the way for a lot of basketball players today. Excellent. Thank you. Not the same job with you, uh, Jayla. So the NBA being formed in 1997, Relatively recent on the grand scale. Um, so, why do you think the WNBA falls behind the NBA and fans and income, et cetera? I don't believe that a WNBA game that is more exciting than a men's game because the intensity and the pace is higher at a men's game rather than at a women's game. And I feel that fans, they would want to go to a more intenser game than just a women's game. So. I feel like if women could maybe step it up a little bit, then I believe that it would be able to level out a little bit more. Thank you. And for the Amber, uh, how is Michael Jordan an inspiration for young basketball players across the world? Well, like all his charities he gave them to, like, I don't know, it's like me, it inspires me to want to like make something out of myself. I feel like I can give to other charities and stuff and he's also a great basketball player and like just watching him and watching him dunk and stuff it inspires me to be a great basketball player so I can get in his position. Thank you. Two speakers join me on the stage, please. Darion Bennett is the son of Darren Bennett and Courtney Rice. He lives in Danville and has been a Carlisle student since fourth grade. He has two brothers, Davin and Demarius. Darion plays on the Carlisle soccer team, otherwise he enjoys gaming and reading. With the nice weather, he will soon go back to Forward. Darion's former, uh, excuse me, Darion's form research considers the brilliant Steve Jobs and the world of iPhones, iPads, and apples he's created. Cole Bryant is the son of Melanie and Rodney Bryant of Martinsville. He came to Carlisle in kindergarten. Cole has two older brothers, Matthew Moore and Wayne Moore. Cole has a variety of interests. He is active in his church youth group. He plays soccer for Carlisle and on the travel team. Cole is a skateboarder and golfer. He is an SCA representative and on the quiet side, he likes to draw. Someday he might become a dentist after studying at Virginia Tech. Cole has studied the extraordinary career of Bill Gates, the Microsoft developer, and world benefactor. Darion, please join me at the podium. Being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying you've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. These are the words of Stephen Paul Jobs, co-inventor and former CEO of Apple, the American company best known for iPads, iPhones, and Mac computers. With Steve Jobs' guidance, Apple transformed cell phones into an all in one device. In a single decade, Steve Jobs was able to 
as far as the smart home revolution in the Apple household. Steve Jobs was, was the son of Abdul Fattah Kennedy and Joanne Sheewell. Born on February 24th, 1955, San Francisco, California, his parents decided to put Jobs up for adoption. He was adopted by Paul and Claire Jobs of Silicon Valley. Jobs first met Stephen Wozniak while attending Homestead High School. Due to the common interest in computers, they clicked into them. After attending Reed College for six months, he dropped out and spent 18 months taking creative classes. To fund the development of the company, Jobs sold his Volkswagen bus and Wozniak sold his scientific calculator. With Apple, Jobs and Wozniak revolutionized the computer industry by making machines smaller, cheaper, intuitive, and easily accessible to the average person. Wozniak created user-friendly computers, which Apple marketed for $666 each. In 1976, the Apple I earned the company around $770,000. The sales made the company's founder millionaires. As a result of Apple's second model, the Apple II, the company's sales increased by 700% to 193 million. Three years later, after a sudden drop in sales, company CEO, John Scully, convinced the board of directors to fire jobs. After being effectively kicked out of Apple, he came up with a plan to make a new company with other fired Apple employees. Going along with his plan, he created a new company, Next. Apple sales continued to drop in early 1996, the new CEO, Judith Gilililo, Emilio, saved the company. Emilio realized that instead of making a more modern version of the operating system, they could just buy it. Luckily for Jobs, Emilio chose to buy the Next Step operating system for $400 million. Five years later, Jobs was back in Apple. Although Emilio was able to save years of effort, he wasn't able to bring the company back and lost $700 million in the first quarter of 1996. Jobs, along with the help of his friend, billionaire Larry Ellison, successfully convinced the company to fire Gil Emilio. Not long after, Jobs explained his plan to save the company. He had gotten rid of the old board of directors and made a deal with Microsoft to settle patent disputes. A month later, he became Apple's CEO. Steve Jobs then began working on ways to increase Apple's customer base once the business had recovered from its decline in the late 1990s. His first idea was what on him what he had nicknamed desktop video, the ability to capture and edit personal videos on Mac. He was confident that, like desktop publishing in the 1980s, desktop video would become a big deal. In 1999, he released the iMac as well as iMovie, a revolutionary digital video editing program. Although the iMac DV was a success, desktop video could not catch on as quickly as Jobs had intended, and they planned to expand desktop video to other devices. Jobs was eager to launch an Apple-branded MP3 player, which is how the iPod was born in March 2001. Although the iPod was released as an exclusive Mac product to increase sales, it was a success from the moment it launched. Although it was expensive, many PC users bought it and had to use it on their machines. This led Steve Jobs and his team to discuss whether Apple should continue to sell a Mac-only iPod or if the device should be made available to Windows customers as well. At first, Jobs refused the idea, but in July 2002, he changed his mind and the first Windows iPods were produced. Following the release of iTunes in 2003, Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Instead of having surgery, he chose to eat alternative diets and use other treatments. Nine months later, with no increase in health, he finally decided to go along with the surgery. Following the surgery, he seemed to be healthy and even spoke of being cured of cancer during the Stanford commencement speech. Yet, at his next speech, many reporters noticed how frail he looked, and concerns about his health continued until 2009, when Apple announced that he would not be the speaker for Macworld due to being on medical leave. Jobs and Apple went on to say that he was fine, despite having his cancer returned. After having life-saving surgery, Jobs came back to Apple much healthier in 2009, eager to finish his many projects. Jobs' cancer then returned for a third time, reminding him to put his affairs in order before his death. He then ensured Apple would continue to carry on without him, and he went on to have his last public appearance in June 2001. Throughout his life, Steve Jobs proved time and time again that despite having disadvantages in life, anyone has a chance to do something great in the world. Between Apple and Next, Jobs affected the lives of millions and will always be remembered as a pillar, as a pillar of the technology industry.
Bill Gates was the world's youngest billionaire, and it wasn't by luck. Bill Gates started Microsoft in 1975. With the help of Paul Allen, they were able to make Microsoft one of the greatest software companies. It created the opportunity for others to mass produce PCs with the system to run. PCs are personal computers that people use to perform many different tasks. PCs take software to run them, and that is precisely what Microsoft is. The software Gates created has allowed families and everyday people to be able to use computers and for big companies to be able to perform many different tasks. Gates was born in Seattle, Washington on October 28, 1955. Gates had been in public school but was enrolled in Seattle's Preparatory Lakeside School when he turned 13. At Lakeside School, Gates was able to use computers in the computer lab and was amazed by what they could do. He found it to be awesome that you could even develop your own programs. Gates met Paul Allen at Lakeside School. Even though Allen was more shy while Gates was more aggressive and energetic, they became friends quickly due to their common interest in computers. In 1972, Allen and Gates founded a company that was supposed to measure traffic patterns in Seattle, but barely worked and didn't do very well. Gates graduated from Lakeside High School in 1973. After high school, he attended Harvard University. Allen went to Washington University, but they kept in touch. Allen told Gates about a kit that was being sold called the Altar 8800 that could be used to make a personal computer. Gates and Allen knew this was a great opportunity and knew that if they did not take the opportunity, someone else would. Allen and Gates contacted the company, claiming that they were developing a basic program that could run on the Altar. Thankfully, micro-instrumentation and telemetry systems asked the boys for a demonstration of their program. Gates and Alan Rush read in the software in Harvard's computer lab. MITS thought the program was good and integrated the software into the Altar 8800. This software eventually became Microsoft. After this, Gates dropped out of Harvard. In 1975, when Microsoft was first released, the software did not sell that well. Although, within the next few years, slowly but surely, Microsoft was able to gain traction. Microsoft soared in revenue and, has, and had surpassed $1 million by the end of 1978. The company relocated its headquarters to Bellevue, Washington in 1979. The next year, the company relocated again, this time, to Redmond, Washington, and went public, raising $61 million at $21 per share. Microsoft had become the world's largest personal computer software firm based on sales by the late 1980s. In August 1980, Microsoft signed a contract with International Business Machines, IBM, to develop software for their first personal computer. This program was finished and was on the market by 1981. Within two years, IBM had sold nearly 750,000 machines. IBM was the largest maker of business machines in the world. The contract with them meant that Microsoft was set. In 1985, Microsoft released Windows, which included a user interface with drop-down menus, scroll bars, and other features. In 1995, Windows 95 was released. Seven million copies of the new system were sold in the first five weeks. Through Bill Gates, PCs have become relevant everywhere. Around the world, over a billion PCs are currently in use by companies and families. Microsoft was successful in making computing an easy experience with user-friendly tools like Windows, Office, and MS Paint. In a recent interview with Matthew Moore, an IT auditor with Eastman Chemical Company, has said that not only have families and ordinary people been able to use Microsoft, but big companies like Eastman use Microsoft's technology every day to create products for finance, for security, and for safety. Companies like this use Microsoft daily to build and function their company. Thousands have been able to create their own applications and programs using Microsoft. Programmers have created over 16 million apps and programs using Windows. As of 2021, Microsoft Windows is the dominating desktop operating system with a share of just below 74%. Like many other wealthy people, Gates eventually turned his priorities away from making money and giving it away. In January 2000, Gates stepped down as the CEO of Microsoft spending his time on philanthropy and other opportunities. One way Gates gives is through his foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has almost completely eradicated polio through distributing the polio vaccine to different countries. 
Through the course of the COVID pandemic, he has donated over $1.75 billion to treating victims and developing diagnostic techniques. Gates has also been a part of the Giving Pledge since 2010. This organization inspires other wealthy people to donate at least half of their fortune before they die. Bill Gates changed how people think about computers. Before Gates and Microsoft, most people never thought of having a computer at their home, much less a computer in their hand. Microsoft has laid the groundwork for all sorts of new software that is being integrated into new devices like VR headsets, phones, and even cars. Through his success, Bill Gates has been able to give back to different foundations and putting his own. Not only does he give, but he also inspires others to give and change the world just as he has. Oh, I really enjoyed hearing about um, Bill Gates. He's, um, he and Melinda have done so much for education. So my question for you deals basically with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, you mentioned you know, his philanthropy and how important that was. And uh, uh, he is committed to a giving pledge. In your research, do you remember what that was all about? The giving pledge? Yes, yeah, so like part of that foundation, or not foundation, pledge, um, he inspires and inspires other people to give at least half of their wealth before they die to uh, charities and foundations like his. Excellent. And he's committed to giving what almost 95 to 99 percent of his own wealth, you know, when he dies. That's just how committed he is. Um, one of the most impressive things, Cole, to me was when they first came out with the foundation, they were very interested in changing high schools. So you could actually apply for these grants if you, were, if you had an idea of how to make a transformative high school. And um, in addition to that, we used the Khan Academy, and he was one of the major funders of the Khan Academy. And one of the things that he said was that it had to be free. Hmm. But thank you, Cole. You did a wonderful job. Um, Steve Jobs, he is one that, uh, you know, when we're looking for, uh, Darion, a quote, like a graduation or whatever, we turn to Steve Jobs because he has all these powerful quotes. But, but one of the things that um, interests me about him is how he transformed the workplace. How did he transform the, the workplace? He was into like collaboration and we are too here at Call Out, we're all into collaboration. So do you have any idea what he did for the workplace? He was a very hard worker and tried to get everyone to work as hard as he did by putting in just many hours and making sure everybody was doing their job correctly. An excellent job. Um, there you are. Just Steve Jobs, obviously, is a very interesting or was a very interesting person. And uh, I think we all see the traits that we're talking about just his work ethic and everything else. But this is, I guess, one of the things that stands out is here's a man who created his own company and then several years later is kicked out of it. So can you imagine going through that? And uh, what do you think it took for him to be able to go through that and come back even stronger? And on the tail end, I want to, are you an Apple man? Apple man, do you prefer Apple? Yes, I do enjoy Apple over Android. And um, as he had quit, or after he got kicked out of Apple and he started next, he said that those were the hardest working hours of his life because he wasn't able to, when he got home, he wasn't able to talk, is what he said. That's amazing. Thank you. Cole, good job. Um, just, I guess, um, uh, now we have an Apple man here. Are you Microsoft, are you a PC person? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I have a PC in my house that I use every day for homework. I love the um, how easy it is to use. Um, so yes, I am a Windows and Microsoft man. Okay, that, that was going to be my question. Why? What, what is the advantage? But the easiness and, and the advantages that you have there. Okay, thank you. There. Uh, so Steve Jobs, talking about Apple, you know, very influential company, you know, new iPhones every year, you know, we started with a little iPod, we keep going. Um, 
However, each year they do seem like they're looking more and more the same. So my question for you is, do you believe consumer technology will ever reach a peak and why or why not? I do believe at some point that there won't be an ability to add anything new to the phones. So whenever that point is, I believe we're going to have to find some new invention to go to to improve. Thank you. Recall, Bill Gates. So you said you use Microsoft yourself, your uh, PC run. Uh, how would computers be different without Microsoft? Um, computers would definitely be different. There would be definitely user interface, like with Apple. I'm not saying that necessarily PCs would have never happened because somebody would have taken the opportunity. You just found it at the right time. So I would say that it would just be, it would just be different. There, I don't know if it would be better, if it would be worse, but it would, it would just be kind of like Apple versus Microsoft, a little bit different. Thank you. The next two speakers will join me on stage. Ben Wood is the son of Mr. James Wood of Martinsville. He has a brother, Copeland Williams. This is Ben's first year at Carlisle. He plays soccer on the Carlisle team. Ben's interest in history and music inform much of his life. He plays guitar and plays in a band with friends and is considering a professional career as a musician. He is also interested in archaeology. Jazz music specifically, its origins and influence, is the subject of Ben's forum research project. Gabrielle Fountain is the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Carrie and Felicia Fountain of Axton. She has an older sister, Kalisha. Gabby is new to Carlisle this year. She is on the women's varsity basketball team and participates in a variety of hobbies. She enjoys video photography and baking, and she sings in the church choir as well as in the Carlisle choir. Gabby is a great reader of economics, feminist topics, and African-American history. She anticipates perhaps attending the University of South Carolina and studying business marketing with an eye to owning her own media company someday. Hmm. As it happens, Gabby will present to us her investigation of the power couple who founded the media giant, Black Entertainment Television, and its importance in contemporary culture. Ben, if you would join me at the podium. The Roaring Twenties were a unique time in American history. Young rattle the streets having fun, people filled clubs and danced to their hearts content. While the band on stage played an alluring music called jazz. Jazz is culturally rich and it has evolved and entertained many for over a century. Jazz began in New Orleans, spread to Chicago, migrated to New York, and evolved musically all across the United States. To this day, jazz still entertains many listeners and certainly influences many musicians. Jazz is a musical genre created by African Americans who brought their musical roots to America. Jazz was influenced by West African tribal music and European classical music, known for using a variety of styles and instruments to create a unique sound. Jazz adopted traits from various styles of music, like blues, ragtime, folk music, and war games, due to being developed during slavery. Another influence from the time of slavery were field hollows and spirituals. Human hollows were songs that were sang by slaves working in the fields, and spirituals were religious songs that were developed by slaves. These songs were expressive of the singer's emotions. Ragtime was a big influence on jazz. Like jazz, ragtime was syncopated. Ragtime also had very similar roots. Ragtime was also influenced by West African and European classical music. Ragtime also adopted Southern African American banjo styles and dance music. Ragtime was fast and upbeat. The blues influence in jazz is also prominent. The blues originated in the Deep South after the Civil War. The blues typically have sad melodies and lyrics that are often passed down by word of mouth. 
Blue songs utilize guitars with slides and harmonicas, which gives the instruments are easy to carry around. The mood of the blues is melancholy, with folk like vocals and sorrowful pools of acoustic guitar work, the blues create sad feelings. The blues were first recorded in the 1920s. The blues were influential on genres like jazz, rock, R&B, country, and even metal. Jazz utilizes harmonic structures found in European classical music. The influence of jazz of West African music is prominent with the presence of syncopation. Syncopation occurs due to simplified polyrhythms, which when the music maintains two melodies at once. Along with syncopation, swing is a major part of jazz. Swing is described as a feeling more than anything. Many believe swing could not occur without syncopation, but this was disproved by famous jazz musicians Louis Armstrong and Bunny Berrigan. They produce swing while playing non-syncopated chord notes. Jazz also takes influence from, in the forms of scales and the instruments that it uses. Guitar, banjo, and percussion instruments derive from African traditions. All instruments like trumpet, trombone, saxophone, bass, and piano were adopted from European music. The birth of jazz was directly connected to the historical condition and practices of the time. Despite the slave trade spanning far wider than just the U.S., the U.S. was the only place where jazz formed. This is believed. This is believed to have occurred due to European classical music only being popular in the U.S. at the time. Slavery, 18th, 19th, and 20th century culture, and other factors in life caused the birth of jazz. The mass migration during the 1800s mixed many cultures in many areas, but only one created jazz: New Orleans. The reason jazz was born in New Orleans can be traced back to the 18th century. New Orleans was originally a French settlement, but then Spain acquired it. Then during the Napoleonic era, the French reacquired it. In 1803, the U.S. and the French had arranged Louisiana purchase, and New Orleans was included. So New Orleans then became a U.S. territory. French culture and music was prominent in New Orleans due to this. French music influenced jazz heavily. Another big part of the music culture was due to Americans, including slaves, who had migrated west after the Louisiana Purchase. As the Spanish-American War had ended in 1898, pawn shops were filled with instruments from army bands that disbanded. This was the first opportunity for early jazz musicians to get actual instruments that they did not have to make by hand. Around the 1910s, music in New Orleans was unique. French culture was prominent due to the French families who had already lived there. This tiny variety of cultures created a melting pot of music called jazz. When jazz was invented, the instruments were looted. Early jazz bands typically consisted of cornets, clarinets, trombones, tubas, bass, piano, and drums. To make up for a lack of diversity, jazz musicians would create a lot of lines on each instrument to create a layer of melodies. Around the time jazz was invented, the storybook district of New Orleans. Streets of story built a lot of bars, hotels, restaurants, and houses in Bill Review. This is where early jazz musicians would play the first forms of jazz. Major jazz musicians such as Louis Armstrong and King Oliver got their start during this time. Both were legendary for creating influential music. Louis Armstrong invented swing and helped jazz spread throughout the country. Armstrong grew up in the story building. Other major musicians of the time were Buddy Bolden, Buddy Petit, Kevin Johnson, and Sidney Bett. A major moment in jazz history was when it was recorded for the first time in January of 1913. A group of white musicians called the original Dixieland Jazz Band recorded their version of jazz. Their recordings of jazz had a barnyard sound to it, but it lacked the true essence of jazz. Even though New Orleans was both the birthplace and biggest center of jazz, it was not the only place where jazz was found. In 1917, the U.S. Navy ordered the closing of the Storyville District. This made jazz musicians relocate across the country. During World War I, factories in the North were promising steady jobs. Chicago quickly became the center of jazz in the United States. In 1918, jazz musician King Oliver moved to Chicago. In 1922, he called for his disciple, Louis Armstrong, to join him. Oliver and Armstrong were a dynamic duo who lit up the stage whenever they played. Armstrong and Oliver would have unique duets during songs. They would both take lead roles and build off one another to create something truly special. The Roaring Twenties were an exciting time in American history. 
jazz quilt was filled during the night, and the young were having fun rebelling against old social norms. The 1920s were called the Jazz Age. Many jazz clothes in the 1920s were owned by gangsters like Al Capone. Selling bootleg liquor was big business during the Prohibition movement. The 1920s were, were a wild time. Organized crime, partying, illegal alcohol, and jazz was at the center of it. These urban behaviors showcased the excitement, adventure, glamour, and daring of the American youth at the time. Louis Armstrong also invented swing during the 20s. In late 1924, Armstrong broke away from King Oliver and moved to New York City to start his own band. Armstrong created a feeling called swing and implemented it into his music. He taught his band, the Hot Five, how to create swing, and thus a staple of jazz was born. Armstrong quickly became the most influential jazz musician of all time. Armstrong is praised as the best trumpet player and interesting vocalist as well. His music not only introduced jazz to the rest of America, but to the whole world. In the 1920s, a form of jazz called orchestral jazz came into play. The creation of orchestral jazz is a credit to Fletcher Henderson and Duke Ellington. Orchestral jazz is typical jazz accompanied by the elements of a proper orchestra. <coughs> Henderson was the first orchestral jazz player. By 1923, Henderson would have a band of 13 people, which was seven to eight more than most jazz bands. Henderson's band would feature brass, percussion, and woodwind. Duke Ellington was a major part of the evolution of orchestral jazz. Ellington made his mark by composing music instead of arranging chord progressions and melodies. Ellington explored different compositional styles, such as club music, basic dance numbers, pop music, ballads, and instrumental pieces. While jazz may have peaked during the Roaring Twenties, it still thrives decades later. When the Great Depression hit, the majority of jazz clubs in Chicago closed, forcing jazz musicians who wanted to continue pursuing their music to move to New York City. Jazz musicians performed composed pieces live, but their favorite pastime was after the show. After patients left, the band would improvise and create original music for hours. Jazz has always found new additions to the music. It has continued to change and adopt elements from other genres. In an interview with Marshall High School student Xavier Dunham, who was an inspiring musician, he made several points about jazz. He stated that jazz is characterized by a 2 5 1 chord progression and its habit of improvisation. He said artists like Louis Armstrong, John Coltrane, and Duke Ellington were influential to the genre. Mr. Dunham believes that jazz will continue to live on in the underground music scene, but he doesn't expect it to get popular again anytime soon. Despite this, Mr. Dunham stated that jazz has influenced other musical genres and still continues to inspire musicians to this day. Robert and Sheila Johnson are examples of black excellence. This powerful couple not only created the first television channel for African Americans, but they are the first black millionaires in America. In 19, 1980, Robert and Sheila Johnson founded Black Entertainment Television. The network serves its African American audience by creating movies, news, and TV shows. This network has made a big contribution to the black community by putting them in positions to create their own content. Robert and Sheila Johnson are role models for aspiring young business. After selling BET to Viacom in 2001, Robert and Sheila Johnson went on to be successful entrepreneurs in separate ventures. Today, Black Entertainment Television is a Fortune 500 company. Robert Johnson was born on April 8, 1946, in Hickory, Mississippi. At the age of 12, he wanted to be an entrepreneur and work for himself. From then on, he was able to pursue his goals strategically. Robert Johnson attended the University of Illinois, majoring in public affairs on scholarship. He acquired jobs as a public affairs officer for the Corporation for, Broadcast, for Public Broadcasting and the Office of the National Urban, National Urban League. Through his work, Johnson learned how television worked and the untapped potential of television for urban audiences. 
Sheila Johnson was born on January 25, 1949, in Pennsylvania. A surgeon father moved the family to Maywood, Illinois, where she went to Frozen Soul High School in Chicago. During high school, Sheila became a concert violinist and the first African American to win a statewide violin competition. In college, she met her future husband, Robert Johnson, and then had two children, Brett Johnson and Paige Johnson. After graduation, she received a job teaching at City Hall Friends, a prestigious private school in Washington, D.C., and later quit to form a concert violinist group called Young Strength International. Though Robert and Sheila Johnson saw success in their own lives, they were discouraged by how African Americans were portrayed on television. During the 60s and 70s, black sitcoms like Good Times and That's My Mama showed black representation of the stereotype. This included living in the ghetto and struggling to make men free. Not until the 80s when Bill Cosby created a different world in the Cosby show that portrayed African Americans as successful in the black community. In 1976, Robert Johnson became a lobbyist for the National Cable Television Association, which offered him connections he needed to launch black entertainment television. Mr. Johnson had the idea to reach African American audiences with the help of John Malone, who was chief executive of telecommunications. Robert Johnson pitched the idea to reach John Malone. Mr. Malone loved the idea and invested $500,000 into the plan. In 1980, Robert and Sheila Johnson created Black Entertainment Television. BET showed two hours of television and had problems with viewership, but that did not stop Robert Johnson from increasing revenues by selling airtime. Advertisers like American TV and Corporate United led BET to a customer war. Taft Broadcasting Company invested $360,000 for 20%. BET moved to independent satellites and started showing television six hours per day. Robert Johnson expanded BET's offerings by creating a new division in 1984 and weekly calling talk shows for celebrities. The HBO division gave them a satellite. This, and this enabled Black entertainment television to turn to 24 hours per day. Finally, BET was making money. BET created three types of shows that formed their bases. His network produced gospel shows like Bobby Brown's Gospel, show that started in 1980 that showed influential gospel shows. Black Entertainment also had a loose cast called the E.T. Night Blues with Michelle Miller and Jack Reed that presented a national news story. And hip hop oriented shows like Rap City that aired during the 1980s. B.E.T. introduced black culture to the world. B.E.T. subscriber base grew to 12 million and finally reached the urban market. In 1987, the network reached $960,000 in profit, and two years later, the subscriber base grew to $22 million with a profit of $23 million. Robert Johnson continued to break barriers by being the first black-owned company to be on the New York Stock Exchange. In 1995, BT grew to $115 million in revenue, and their subscriber base increased to $43 million in households was by showing the trial of O.J. Simpson. Today, BET focuses on racial injustice and black achievement. The network creates just social injustice themed series like Boiling Point that focuses on the struggle for racial equality. And produces shows, TV shows like Black Girls Rock that honor and promote black accomplishments. In 2001, Mr. Johnson sold BET to Viacom for $3 billion became one of the first black billionaires. Robert Johnson established RLJ Company and bought an NBA franchise called the Charlotte Hornets. Robert and Sheila Johnson divorced in 2002 and she left BET to pursue her own business ventures. Ms. Johnson started her own spa management firm in Northern Virginia and also purchased a WNBA basketball team, the Washington Mystics. Ms. Johnson became one of the first African-American women to be a billionaire. Black Entertainment Television today 
still serves the African American audiences by creating content that focuses on African American culture, achievement, wealth, and racial equality. BET has recently produced comedy drama shows like The First Boss Club and Tyler Perry Sisters that focuses on black women in powerful professions. BET started off as a vision and now it, it has become a powerful network that celebrates modern African American culture. Ian, my first question is for you, and again, wonderful job. Um, I'm, I really like jazz, and you kind of disappointed me when you said it was kind of falling by the wayside. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things you mentioned, and I'd like for you to just clarify it for me, please. You mentioned a group, and you said that this particular group lacked the true essence of jazz. Uh, that was, was it the Barnyard? Uh, yeah, the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Okay, what what was the true essence? I didn't quite understand that. So could you elaborate on that a little for me? All they took from the original real form of jazz in New Orleans was kind of the energy it had, but aside from that, they just added that to their music and just called it their own. It really wasn't. Thank you very much. You mentioned um, um, the fact that um, in terms of um, Gabby Black, the BET, you mentioned that they, all of a sudden, things just took off for them. Originally, they had difficulty getting people to, to sponsor them. What did they offer that made the difference? And finally, people started advertising with them and they finally started to make money. Because I know that, that Ebony refused to, to advertise with them, uh, Jet refused, or they were not willing to put in the money that needed to be put in. So what happened that turned everything around and all of a sudden people were actually interested in advertising with BET? I think it was because of Robert Johnson. He, um, you know, expanded the offerings, and he started to create shows and put people in positions to produce the TV shows that focused on um, what was happening at that time. Um, they produced shows like Teen Summit that focus focuses on um, teens, um, black teens. Uh, what they go through every day, and I think that um, people like to wanted to watch that type of show because that um, influenced um, other teenagers as well, and it was something that they could relate to. So that's what everyone wants to see is something that they can relate to or what they go through every single day. Thank you, and you both did a wonderful job. Man, you. Uh I think it was mentioned that you're a musician yourself. Yes, man. Uh, are you a jazz player? Uh, I tend to implement a few techniques from, but I tend to I tend to play more rock, hard rock, metal stuff. So. Okay. All right. Another thing, and you mentioned I know there's a local high school here who has their own jazz band. What what would be the appeal to a high school student to, to be a part of a, a jazz band based on the history that you just shared with us? Well, the music is very appealing, and when you enjoy it. I guess when you're part of jazz, but you feel like you're a part of something and right. people are around you. Okay, thank you. All right. Gabby, uh, great presentation, both of you. Um, you may have hit on this a little bit, um, but what do you think were the major obstacles that the Johnsons had when they had this idea and they tried to take it forward? What do you think were the major things that they had to overcome? Um, for one, the urban markets. Mm -hmm. There was not much um, representation in the urban markets, so they were just getting started um, reaching the urban markets. Back then, you know, um, people were watching uh, MeTV or, or those types of um, networks, but there was no black entertain black oriented network out there at that time. So I think they were they you know created black entertainment at that. A great time. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. 
push missions for Gabby. So, see, Black Entertainment was really the first uh, network to diminish many stereotypes that was represented in television of African Americans. And my question is, how do you think that BET influenced public perception of African Americans then and now? Well, I think um, their TV shows that they put out now, they're putting out um, how black people are in professions like being a lawyer or a doctor. Back then, they were just, you know, uh, the maid or, you know, living in the ghetto and making, you know, minimum wage. And now we, we're on TV as we're six figures. We're um, in corporate America. We're, we're setting the standard and, and we're changing things. So. Thank you. And for Ben, uh, I'm a musician myself. I have some friends that do that to the jazz band at Um I think that the people that like jazz are really into it, and the people that don't like jazz normally aren't. <laughs> so my question for you is, do you think jazz is overall underappreciated uh, by most people? And how has your research changed your own appreciation of jazz? I think that jazz is underappreciated in the sense that in terms of the talent and hard work that goes into it nowadays, it doesn't get recognized for what it is. What was the last one? Oh, uh, and how does it change your own appreciation? I research. I appreciate the culture behind it a lot more now. I realized the whole scene, the whole culture that time was very rich. Very powerful. Thank you. And amazing job with you. Hudson Bell came to Carlisle in fifth grade. His parents are Sherry Bell and Maurice Bell. He lives in Martinsville. His older siblings are Morgan, Justin, Madison, and Reese, and Hudson participates in many sports, including, but not limited to, biking, soccer, tennis, travel soccer, dirt biking, shooting, gaming, and golf. In his spare time, he is in the scouts and doing his schoolwork. He found time these last few weeks to learn about the beginnings of the stock market and, more, and some particulars of how it works. Maxie Garrett is the daughter of Philip and Karen Garrett of Martinsville. Her brother, Webb, is a Carlisle junior. She came to Carlisle in kindergarten. Maxie is an active member of the middle school players, having been in the Lion King, Toy Story, Aladdin, and the Trail Walk presentation. She represents Carlisle on the JV and varsity soccer teams and on the women's varsity basketball team and on the tennis team as well. She is vice president of the SCA. Outside of school, Maxie plays on travel soccer, PYSL team, and enjoys hiking, kayaking, and skiing. For Forum, Maxie has studied a man who is much associated with sports, Phil Knight, and his athletics giant, Nike. Please welcome Hudson to the podium. Fifty-six percent of Americans own stock. Since the first stock market over 500 years ago in Amsterdam, stocks have enriched billions of people all across the world, whether they themselves invested in stocks or not. In the 600 years since the first stock market, it has steadily grown into an engine that drives all of investing and commercial growth. The New York Stock Exchange started as a small group of men trading in the shade of a tall sycamore tree. It has seen high points like the Roaring Twenties and low points like the Great Depression. The stock market is an area, digital or physical, where investors go to buy or sell shares in a company. A share is a small percentage of a company available for purchase. Companies sell shares so they can increase their funds in order to expand their business. The price of a share in any publicly traded company is affected by supply and demand. The more people who want to buy shares in any given company, the higher the price is for a share. The 
there is less interest in a company, the price of their shares will be lower. The first modern stock exchange was created in Amsterdam, Netherlands in 1610. The Dutch East India Company, a company devoted to trade and colonization, was the first publicly traded company. The company wanted to increase its cash flow, so they decided to sell off small percentages of their company and pay dividends. Dividends are sums of money paid regularly to investors. They could use the immediate funds to grow, and with the extra money they made, they would pay the dividends. This is the model for trading companies and modern corporations today. It took over a century and a half for the stock market to travel to America. In New York City in 1792, the Buttonwood Tree Agreement was made by a group of 24 merchants. It was called this because, according to legend, most business on Wall Street at the time was conducted under an American sycamore tree, also known as a buttonwood tree. The men later conducted their business daily in a nearby tavern. Their intentions were to create a more regulated stock market to prevent illegal sales and excessive broker commissions. During the first half of the 1800s, information on the stock market had to be delivered by mail. News sent from New York to the West Coast could take several months to arrive. As the stock market spread throughout the United States, it became more apparent that investors needed a quick and reliable source of stock news and information. On November 15, 1867, the world's first stock ticker was invented. It was unveiled in New York City, and it revolutionized the stock exchange. A stock ticker is a device used to show a stock symbol, the price per share of a stock, how many shares have been traded, and the amount of stock has gone up or down compared to the price at the market's close the day before. The stock ticker was invented by a man named Edward Callahan, who converted a telegraph machine to print the stock market information onto thin strings of paper. Investors should also be able to easily tell which direction the stock market is headed. Dow Jones and Company is a stock news company founded in the late 1800s by Charles Dow and Edward Jones. The men believed that investors would benefit from having a simple index to tell if the market was going up or down. The stocks selected for the Dow were picked because they were reflective of the American economy at that time. The price that is shown on the Dow is calculated by adding the prices of all the stocks in the average and dividing them by 0.14. Now the Dow consists of 30 stocks instead of its original 12 stocks. Of the 30 companies now included in the Dow, the most recognizable among them are Microsoft, Apple, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and Nike. The time from the 1890s through the 1920s is considered the golden age of American business. The 1920s was one of the best decades ever for the American stock market, during which the nation's wealth more than doubled. More than 10% of Americans invested in the stock market, or about 13 million Americans. The booming post-war economy caused the average salary to rise by 20%. In just one decade, the number of millionaires rose from 7,000 to 40,000. Stock prices broke all records, far exceeding the value of their corporations. This was an ominous sign for times to come. All of this good fortune could not last forever. On October 24, 1929, the market dropped 11% in an event that came to be known as Black Thursday. After the initial panic on October 24, another wave of investors tried to sell their now worthless stocks. 16 million stocks were sold on Tuesday the 29th, smashing the record set five days earlier by nearly 4 million stocks. By October 30th, the market was down about 25% from where it had been two weeks prior. Companies went bankrupt, millions were unemployed. Some corporations were reduced to shells. It took America over a full decade to recover, and the effects were so serious that experts on the stock market are still asked to reassure people that something like that could never happen again. When asked if he thought something of the same magnitude would ever happen again, Wardy Farrell, a stockbroker at Davenport Company, said, it would be naive to say never. While the financial crisis of 08-09 or the violent drop in February and March of 2020 weren't as prolonged or as impactful overall as what happened in the 1930s, who knows what might happen. 
nearly 600 years since the first stock trading, the stock market has become a necessary tool for companies that want to expand. It is a major advancement in technology, science, engineering, and every other field. Today, the New York Stock Exchange represents more than 55% of the world's stock markets, towering over every other market. Without the stock market, Apple and Microsoft would have never made it out of the garages they were founded in, and major chain companies would be non-existent. Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, once said, the only time you must not fail is the last time you try. Knight knew what he was talking about. He tried and failed so many times that he lost count, but he never gave up. He always tried again. The company that would become the $226 billion athletic wear giant started with Knight selling no-name shoes out of the trunk of his car. From these humble beginnings, he grew the company that now sells 60% of the athletic shoe market. Before Nike, there were companies like Champion, Puma, and Converse. Since the 1980s, Nike has been the biggest company in the athletic world. Nike sells more shoes and other gear to the NBA, NCAA, and more than any other corporation. Philip Hampson Knight was born February 24, 1938, in Portland, Oregon. His parents were William W. Knight and Loda Knight. His dad was a lawyer and newspaper publisher, and his mom was a stay-at-home mom. They made a decent living and gave Knight a good childhood and education. He attended Grover Cleveland High School in Portland, Oregon, where he was not much of an athlete, having failed in baseball. He took up running and found he loved it. It pushed him and helped clear his mind. Without the shift of track, he probably would have never started Nike 20 years later. He continued his run running career at the University of Oregon in Eugene with coach Bill Bowerman. Bowerman was a legendary track coach with four national titles to his credit. He coached the 1972 Olympic track team. He and Bowerman, he and Knight hit it off immediately, and Bowerman would become a big influence on his life. He went on to business school at Stanford University, where he took a class in small business methods that would change his life. The professor assigned the students to develop a plan for a new business. He came up with the idea of doing what Japanese cameras did to the German cameras with shoes. Knight graduated with a master's in business, in business administration, but he left with a mission on life. He borrowed some money from his father and took off for Japan where he pitched his idea of creating a shoe company in the United States. Knight made an appointment at a Japanese factory called Onitsuka Tire Company. He pitched a proposal to them and they agreed to let Knight represent them. He named his company Blue Ribbon Sports. In Japan, he saw a little girl with cardboard shoes, which inspired him to make shoes more affordable and accessible. Bowerman received some of these Japanese shoes from Knight and liked them, so they performed a partnership with 49% for Bowerman and 51% for Knight for the Blue Ribbon Company. His business was growing, so he hired Jeff Johnson as a commissioned salesman, and his last job was the Senior Director of Product Development and Planning of Global Apparel at Nike. Like Knight, Johnson and Bowerman were all competitive and dedicated to the company's success. They got a better chance to contract. They got a better contract for more shoes from, from Onitsuka and improved the shoe for heavier, taller American runners. Johnson opened their first retail store in Santa Monica, California. The shoe business was not yet lucrative enough, so Knight got a position as an assistant accounting teacher at Portland State. He started dating a girl in his class, Penelope Parks. A few months later, they were married. Knight was skeptical of their new contract with Onitsuka when he went to Onitsuka and signed a three-year contract, although he wanted a five-year. Onitsuka was disappointed in sales and dropped Blue Ribbon, his first failure in the shoe business. Knight later went to a well-known factory in Mexico and signed a deal to get shoes. Knight's graphic designer created a new logo that represented motion. Now it is known as the Nike Swoosh. 
Johnson came up with the idea of the company name, Nike, who was the Greek goddess of victory. At first, Knight did not love it, but he said it would grow on him. As it turned out, it grew on nearly everybody. Knight grew Nike and made its way to the Olympics in 1972. Nike spikes were not ready to be used in the actual competition, but they were used in training. Now, Nike is the most used track and field shoe business in the world. Bowerman later had the idea of the waffle sole. He pitched the idea to Nike and they started making them. The shoe quickly grew and it doubled Nike's profit to $8.4 million. To this day, the waffle shoe is used in shoes and was an amazing discovery for Bowerman. In 1977, most college teams were endorsed by Adidas, but Nike got a few teams. Nike continued to grow but needed more ways to expand. They found them endorsements of famous athletes. Fans want to be like their athletic heroes. If they can't score or run like them, at least they can wear the same gear. Phil Nye used this simple idea to cash it in. Nike endorses famous athletes who can promote and sell products. The company pays athletes to wear the shoes or clothes. The biggest Nike endorsement is with Cristiano Ronaldo, a legendary soccer player who has a lifetime deal for a billion dollars. In 1984, Nike offered Michael Jordan a contract. Jordan is the best basketball player ever, some say. As he rose to the top, Nike's Air Jordans rose with him. Nike has created 35 editions of Jordan's signature shoes. Nike's net worth from Air Jordan is around $3 billion. Michael Jordan himself every year makes $130 million just from Air Jordan. Like many American products, Nike shoes are made in China because they are cheaper to make there. Chinese labor wages are less than half American wages. The British Broadcasting Corporation accused Nike of using child labor in their manufacturing. In another report from Life magazine, the Chinese Uyghur workers were forced to pick cotton for Nike. Nike plans to donate over $100 million to organizations who help with racial, social, and educational rights after this issue. Uyghurs are a Chinese Muslim ethnic group that are subject to torture and persecution by the Chinese Communist government. Nike does not confirm nor deny that it is true, and the company said they are trying to fix the issue. Phil Knight's shoe company has come a long way since 1972. Nike employs 75,000 people worldwide in its headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon. Knight stepped down from his position of the board of directors in 2006. The board chose Mark Parker to fill his spot. Since retiring, Knight has devoted much of his time and philanthropic work, such as his $2.9 billion donation to the University of Oregon and Stanford University. Today, Knight's net worth is around $54.4 billion. Knight, with all his experience, gave lessons that he has learned throughout his life. Knight says the most important thing is to take chances rather than leaving your wasted talent behind. Hmm. Good job, Hudson. Um, why did you choose the stock market talk topic? I'm just curious. Um, I have a small portfolio, and I've always found the stock market to be interesting. <laughs> well, wonderful. How is it doing? Uh, right now, with the Russia-Ukraine situation, not great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Maxie, uh, Sports Illustrated gave Phil Knight the title of um, the most powerful man in sports. Why would that be suitable for him? He changed the athletic world by creating new opportunities for shoes and clothes with athletes, famous and ones that are small just starting out. He deserved it, he worked hard for it, and he changed the shoe world and athletic world forever. Hudson, you answered my question already. I was gonna say, once you get into the the world of work where you're going to be a part of the stock market, but honestly, you're already there. So <laughs> congratulations. You're right. Uh, and I don't do a lot of stock, but this is kind of a scary time now. So what adjustments do you feel like you need to make in your portfolio right now? Um, I don't know. There's so much uncertainty. You're right. The impossibility of war and 
just everything else with the sanctions going on in Russia and no trade going through from there. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maxie, I was just wondering, in your research, because um, I'm a big college fan, especially football, basketball, things like that, how has Nike, like for instance, getting signed contracts with universities just to use Nike apparel alone, how has that helped? Them? Did you see anything about that helping the profitability of the company? Yeah, um, without the endorsements, Nike at first was not able to do that because they did not have enough money. But after they continued to grow, they got endorsed by colleges, became more well-known, and are now who they are today. So it helped them grow. Thank you. Uh, it's something job both of you. I know it's really difficult to get up here and say speeches like this, but give yourself a pat on the back for getting it all out. Uh, for Hudson, how do you think the stock market has helped poor and middle class the poor and middle class population in America? I think it doesn't take much money to invest in the stock market, even if it's one or two stocks. And if you pick well, you can definitely make some money off of it if you time it right. Thank you. That's Maxie. How would athletic shoes be different today without Nike's influence? Without Nike, the other brands like Adidas and Puma and Champion that were already there, I don't think they would continue to grow as much as Nike because Nike had so many great workers who just wanted success for them. So I feel like it still would be similar, but not as big without Nike because they are known worldwide and they're the biggest shoe company in the world. Thank you. Please join me again in thanking our panelists for today. <laughs> and a huge round of applause for our eighth grade speakers today. They did an amazing job. <laughs> and this concludes our first day of eighth grade forum. Thank you.